everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Bobby Chesney. I'm the director of the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law here at the University of Texas. Uh, thanks for coming to the virtual campus to join us today for what's going to be a really fun discussion. I'm going to turn it over immediately to my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Mariba Ja, who is the, uh, the head of the Strauss Center's uh, Space Security and Safety Program and all around awesome guy and fascinating scholar. And Mariba, the floor is all yours. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Bobby. Um, today, I have uh, the distinguished honor and pleasure of introducing my Brumley fellow, uh, Alyssa Gessler. Alyssa is a second year graduate student pursuing a dual degree in global policy and Middle Eastern studies at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. Prior to joining the UT community, Alyssa worked in foreign policy in New York City for three years. First, at the Mission of Jordan to the United Nations, and thereafter, in the Executive Office of the Council on Foreign Relations. Alyssa's research aims to increase transparency, predictability, and accountability in space by employing natural language processing to better understand Arab state behaviors in space. This research will ideally help to decrease the likelihood of conflict resulting from a misunderstanding of state intentions in space and will aid in the creation of international norms of behavior in space by providing further clarity on the motivations of Arab nation states in space. And with that, take it away, Alyssa. Thank you, Dr. Ja, I appreciate it. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diane Howard. Dr. Diane Howard is Chief Counsel for Space Commerce at the U.S. Department of Commerce. In addition to providing space law expertise to the Office of Commerce and the Department of Commerce as a whole, Dr. Howard participates in interagency work and is actively involved in the Office of Space Commerce's implementation of Space Policy Directive No. 3 on space traffic management. Dr. Howard is a non-resident scholar here at the Strauss Center and is also an adjunct professor of law at the UT School of Law, where she'll be teaching a two credit space law course this spring, by the way, for any interested students. She's helping to develop the Strauss Center's space security and safety program, a transdisciplinary program offering opportunities to work on solutions to challenges in the space environment through a combination of law, policy, engineering, and science curricula. Prior to joining UT Austin, Dr. Howard was one of the original architects of a similar multidisciplinary program at the undergraduate level in Daytona Beach, Florida at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Dr. Howard first became involved in space endeavors in 2004 on both the domestic and international levels. She was a citizen advocate for the passing of the Commercial Space Law Amendments Act of 2004, a critical piece of US legis legislation that made possible the development of innovative technologies and a burgeoning commercial space transportation industry. Dr. Howard has also participated in the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Capacity Building Initiatives in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil and Kiev, Ukraine. After working as a staff attorney in the Florida Appellate Courts for some years, she decided to specialize in space law and attended McGill University's Institute of Air and Space Law, her LLM thesis centered upon private space law issues and her doctoral work focused upon effective spaceport regulation. And might I add that Dr. Howard was recently named a member or acad academician, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, thank you, of the International Academy of Astronautics. So congratulations, Dr. Howard, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Chesney and Dr. Jaw and Alyssa and Carolyn and Lindsay for making this possible and for having me. I, I uh, look forward always to my interactions and my engagements with the Strauss Center and also with all of you Brumley Fellows. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about space resources. And this is something that, um, I mean, there was a thing in today's news about how uh, ESA has now signed on to be a partner in Gateway. So um, it's going to be a conversation conversation, I, I invite you to, if you have a question that sort of percolates as I'm speaking, because I am going to talk with some slides, um, by all means, put your question in the Q&A and we'll curate it and, and, and address it in real time. And if you want to wait till the end, that's fine too. So let me see if I can share my screen. And let's see. Okay. 
how are we? Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, play from start. How are we doing? Look at that, okay. So we're just gonna have a conversation and I'm gonna kind of give you the lay of the land first, today's itinerary. Not only do we have uh, wonderful things going on with regard to the gateway, but we have a really super cool thing going on right now when that's Osiris Rex, and that's my dog Gigi, she's agreeing with me. She always weighs in on the international issues. Um, so this, this is a little picture in the very bottom is, is something that's uh, got some, some relevance to um, resources because this is uh, a robotic uh, mission from NASA that's gone to Bennu and has taken some of some materials. Gigi, you have to stop. And has taken some materials and, and in fact, so much material that we don't even know if it's going to make it back. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, mining resources off planet and some of the issues, some of the legal issues. Oh my goodness, is there space law that's even relevant to that? So we'll touch on that. If, we, if there is, where does it come from? What is it? What does it, you know, what does it uh, involve? Um, and then we're talking uh, more and more about commercial or private activities um, off Earth, but definitely with regard to mining off Earth. And so what exactly does that mean and how does that fit into the, the legal framework? And I'm gonna talk about things in terms of crawl, walk, run. I'll, I'll link that up to some of the initiatives that are underway. We'll talk a little bit about exploration and use, and then also resource utilization, how they, they link up. And so let's start by talking about what space law is. So I'm going to give you two ways to look at this. I'm going to, oh, let's go back. I'm going to give you a definition by a gentleman named Stephen Doyle, a, a well-known legal academic. And he talks about things in terms of this, this, the space law is the whole, the res, the whole body of national and international legislation. And that, that's going to include directives, like policy directives. It's going to include things like regulations, things in the Code of Federal Regulations, I'm going to translate translating this into US terms, treaties and agreements and, and conventions that are created to enable, to manage and to regulate or restrict activities that are in or related to outer space. So to parse those out into some of the, the elements or the characteristics of what he said in a lot of words, I'm gonna give you a break at, breakdown. One moment, I'm gonna move my dog. Hold on, just one moment. Sorry, Gigi, you lost your ticket. So sorry about that. Okay, so Eileen Galloway is a name, if you are interested in space law, you should know this name. Eileen Galloway is the grand dame or the godmother of space law. In fact, she's she's the uh, the person in the U.S. here who's responsible for for a lot of the drafting of the Space Act of 1958, which is what formed NASA. So she she was there in the early days of space law. And we're going to talk about you know the different uh, phases of development of space law on the next slide. But she broke it out into these elements that space law had a national element, a national component and an international one at the same time. And that not only was space law about the things that occurred in an area, about the, the area itself, but also the things that are happening in that area. So, so you have it for the environment, the domain, and then everything that's happening within the domain. And, and it developed, I'm going to give you everything on the slide again, um, in four interrelated phases. So I want you to, to, to note that these interrelated phases are not completely linear. So the first one went from like, probably really predates 1910 because you know there were uh, science fiction writers in, in the late 19th century that were starting to talk about activities in outer space. And every now and then they would you know kind of talk about the management of social interactions, which is really a lot of what law is. But the concepts really didn't start to, to crystallize until 1910. And, and they the, the, the early development, we, we see that up until 1957 when it was just conceptual, there were no laws, there were no treaties. Now, at the end of this slide deck, which I am making available to uh, my colleagues, um, there's a lot of supplemental material. And if you are, um, if you have an appetite for um, some vintage reading and, and historical reading, I give you a whole lot of the authors and the, them, what they were responsible for in the supplemental materials at the end. So you might find that useful, a lot of stuff to look up more likely in Google Scholar than in Google itself. So those concepts begin in 1910, they go to 1957, and, 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 and 
then they kind of move into a, a little bit more of a formalized process, not just ideas, not just theories, but into things that actually begin to establish the principles that ultimately become the Space Act of 1958 that I just mentioned, but also the Declaration of Principles that ultimately informed the Outer Space Treaty and everything that came after. And that period, those basic principles, we really, we, we um, really limit that to 1957 to 1966. And the reason that we use 1966 as the outside is because those basic principles that are under construction in those years really become codified in 1967 when the Outer Space Treaty enters into force. Then at the same time that, that those things are going on, um, the rules and the regulations are also beginning to um, bubble up. They're, they're starting to percolate because the principles are informing, but we have activities going on which are making the principles, you know, how do we implement that principle in this situation? And then you get to phase four, and phase four is where we are right now, developing rules and regulation for extraterrestrial human settlements and activities activities and that's that's where you find that the uh, the resource conversation is there in phase four which is where we are now it's an exciting time so where does this happen well internationally this happens in copious and for the most part not only but for the most part you'll note there are three main bullets on this slide we have copious which stands for the committee for the peaceful uses of outer space um, but we also have the International Telecommunications Union and the Conference on Disarmament. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about COPUS first. So COPUS is not a specialized agency like the ITU. Um, it's actually uh, a committee that answers to the fourth committee at the United Nations. Um, it consists of two subcommittees. One is the legal subcommittee and the other is the science and technical subcommittee. And you can see from the very beginning that space law has been transdisciplinary from the get-go. In fact, I like to think of it as the yin and yang of space. You know, we, we need both. In fact, Eileen Galloway, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, she said that, that this was one of the things about space law that made it so unique, is that we, we really needed to have the, the science and technical people informing those laws, and we needed the, the legal people talking about just because you can do it, is it, should we be doing it? And if we should be doing it, how should we be doing it? Now, COPUIS is interesting because there are no votes uh, at, at COPUIS. COPUIS takes decisions by consensus which means uh, that there are no objections that are raised. It's the first uh, place in the United Nations that actually adopted a consensus methodology. Certainly it's not the only. And at the General Assembly, they, they do vote, but, but uh, we, we have so far been able to uh, negotiate treaties and, and also uh, soft law documents like guidelines and um, come to resolutions that are relatively constructive, um, it has become increasingly more of a challenge um, over the years because the membership of that Committee of Peaceful Uses of Outer Space has gotten larger. And as it's gotten larger, you have more and more equities and interests that are at play. But the good thing about consensus is that it gets people talking. And everybody, it's one state, one vote. Um, now, that nobody, uh, if, if you happen to be a permanent observer and you're representing, uh, you, you are from a non-governmental organization or an intra-governmental organization like the European Space Agency, you don't get to raise an objection, which would hold up the process of, of taking the decision, but you can, you can be invited to express viewpoints, but it is the member states that actually will raise interventions. And then we have the International Telecommunications Union, as I mentioned, it is a specialized agency and it, it handles spectrum management and it, it is based not in Vienna like Copuis, but in Geneva, where the other, the Conference on Disarmament is located as well. The Conference on Disarmament deals with national security and international security issues, not only pertinent to space, but certainly space is becoming more and more a part of that. And instead of answering to the fourth committee, as Copuis does, it answers to the first committee. In, the, in, in uh, recent years, there's, um, it, it, it's getting 
less and less distinct, the bright line between first and fourth committee and the safety and the peaceful uses and the security and, and, and those issues. It's become more and more inter, interwoven. However, um, there are benefits to keeping them separate and having a good dialogue between, and that's where we are, that's where we are right now. So we also have at the international level, we have treaties. And I said, we we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, so we, we know we have space law, we know where it comes from at the international level. And so what does it encompass? So when we're talking about the treaties, we're talking about hard law. We're talking about legal obligations. So not for everybody necessarily, um, but for all that ratify or accede to the treaty. Um, there are some things in the Outer Space Treaty which have, um, I, I would say that there, it's well settled that some things in the Outer Space Treaty have risen to the level of customary international law, um, but not all things. And some things still remain um, sort of evolving and, and in transformation. And certainly the, the parts of the Outer Space Treaty that are, are very relevant to uh, resource utilization off Earth, uh, th those are not customary international law. So the Outer Space Treaty entered into force in 1967. It took a mere, uh, I think it was like three or four months from when it was that the uh, text was finalized and signed off on and to when it, it uh, reached the threshold to enter into force, which is extremely quick. And in fact, there are scholars from back in the 60s when all of this were going on who said that this was like a Groschen moment and that some of these things became enshrined in customary international law. For instance, that the exploration and use of space would be for the benefit of all humankind. It, it actually says mankind, but I made it more, more in keeping with uh, where we're at right now. And that's Article 1. Um, there's also a theme of international cooperation and that that's that's enshrined that's that's well settled article 3 adopts already uh, existing international law including the UN Charter um, the other four treaties um, built upon the framework and this framework um, revealed the gaps as these ap uh, applications began and the implementation began to uh, mature, we began to see that, huh, you know, just, just saying that a state is uh, internationally liable, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't maybe enough. So um, what we have in Article 7, which is the, the beginnings of what will become the Liability Convention, gets flushed out in the actual Liability Convention. Um, in Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty, we have the we have the beginnings of discussion about what happens if something goes wrong and, and astronauts who are talked about in terms of envoys of mankind they're stranded somewhere well then we have the return and rescue agreement which talks about them not so much as it it doesn't talk about them as envoys of mankind but instead as personnel of the mission and it gives us a much more practical way to deal with situations when they go wrong um we we really talk about the Outer Space Treaty, the Liability Convention, the Registration Convention, and the Return and Rescue Agreement, those, those, we talk about them in terms of being the core four. And there is a Moon Agreement, which did enter into force. It took a, a few years. The uh, text was finalized in 79, and it didn't enter into force until 82. Um, so it took a lot more time than, than the Outer Space Treaty had, but it, uh, it doesn't it doesn't enjoy the kind of um, near universal acceptance, and um, there are no no real spacefaring uh, nations that have uh, ratified or acceded to it. There are a, a few um, that are spacefaring, but not major powers. Um, each of the four treaties begin with an iteration of the basic principles, and then they go on. And I, I give you more about that in the supplemental materials. So I want to excerpt a few of the articles in the Outer Space Treaty that are really relevant to the discussion on resources. For instance, the one I mentioned before, the space freedom, as we call it, which is the, the freedom to explore and to use for the benefit and the interest of all countries. And then Article 2, which is very, very relevant, and that is that Outer space isn't subject to national appropriation by claim, by use, by occupation, or by any other means. So you have that little legal catch-all phrase there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about Article 1 and Article 2 and, and, and how they um, work with each other and how national law and also international initiatives have 
been managing that tension between those two further on in this talk. Article six, which is the starting point for private activities in space, because we're gonna talk about, well, you know, we have government things like, you know, Gateway and Artemis, and, and, and Artemis, and then we also see a role for the private sector in some of these as well. Um, Article 6 contemplates that spa space activity is going to be by governmental agencies, but also by non-governmental. And this came about, um, this was a, a hotly negotiated point back in the 60s. Um, needless to say, the U.S. was lobbying or, or, or vying for the proposition that non-governmental entities um, could, could be, uh, it, was, it was permissible for them to be exploring and using and, and pursuing those space freedoms. However, the Soviet Union had its concerns and, and the US was already involved in, in, in some private sector involvement in telecommunications by this time. So, so how this was uh, resolved was by this sort of uh, compromise. And that is that state parties to the treaty would have international responsibility. The state would have responsibility for treaty compliance by either its governmental actors or its non-governmental or private actors. So the state takes responsibility for what the private sector does. And it it Im imposes or, or it, uh, it exerts this, this responsibility by, require, by, by putting together some sort of authorization and continuing supervision. But it doesn't tell us how, how that's done. So different countries um, have different kinds of frameworks to address this Article 6 authorization and continuing supervision uh, obligation. So Article, Article 7, which is the, uh, the seeds of the liability convention, um, Actually, I think this it should say Article 8. So this is a typo on my part. I'm so sorry. So Article 8 is actually is the seeds of the registration convention. Article 7 is the seeds of the liability convention, and we're not going to talk about that right now. But for Article Article 8 is very pertinent because do, do countries on Earth even have any kind of jurisdiction over the things that are happening somewhere else? So we're talking about utilizing resources, mining them. How is it that here on Earth are going to exert that, that influence, especially when there's no claim of, you can't claim sovereignty, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't occupy. So this is called quasi-territoriality, and it's done through Article 8, typographical error. I will fix this before I circulate it. And it says basically, and it's followed up in the registration convention, that the state parties on whose registry a, state, a space object is listed, that state that registers that space object will retain jurisdiction and control over that object. So there's the hook. There's the hook. And that includes the personnel while in outer space or on a celestial body. So yes, there is a way for states to exert some control. But there's more. We also have Article 9. Article 9 is my favorite article in the Outer Space Treaty. I call it the Golden Rule article. Um, and, and as I go through the little laundry list of some of its most uh, most outstanding elements, you'll you'll, you'll see why. Um, it's it's really Article Nine is is the article that I believe um, is the rationale for all of our space traffic management work as well. But but certainly it has a, a definite role in resource utilization and, and the things that we're going to be doing off Earth. So first and foremost, we're guided by the principle of cooperation and mutual assistance helping one another. That the activities of a state party, that they, they must be performed with due regard for the corresponding interests of the other state parties, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Hence, I call it the golden rule. Avoid harmful contamination and adverse changes to Earth's environment. Avoid harmful interference with the activities of other states. So, Within that avoiding harmful interference, there's, there's two pieces here. One is a duty to notify if you are the actor and you think that your activities might maybe possibly have some sort of uh, harmful or adverse uh, interference or, or effect on somebody else's activities, you have a duty to consult with them. You have a duty to notify. And if you 
are the actee. You believe that somebody else's actions are going to impact you. You have a right to ask to be consulted with. You have a right to consultation. Now, those are pretty key. And we're going to see those um, as they, they reflect in some, some very recent initiatives um, at, as we go go forward in this talk. So Article 12 also has some relevance here. Article 12 says that all stations and installations and equipment and space vehicles on the moon and celestial bodies, it, it applies to all of them. It says that you, you can put them there, but if you do, they have to be represent, open. They have to be open, transparent and open to representatives of other state parties to the Outer Space Treaty. And this is done, it's handled on the basis of reciprocity. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just show up uninvited. It means that you have to give some reasonable notice. Um, there should be some appropriate consultations, maximum precautions. There's, there's always uh, issues with, with regard to techno technology transfer and export control. So, so these things have to be managed in a sensitive way. We have to assure the safety of those visitors and, uh, and avoid those that are visiting must avoid interference with the normal operations. But again, this is in, in a spirit of inclusion, a spirit of inclusivity. We also have some things at the international Dr. level. That, Howard, yeah, we yeah. have a quick question before you proceed, if, if we could. Yeah. Um, so a participant has an inquiry related to Space Force. Specifically, yeah. how do the stated goals of the Space Force advocated by the Trump administration fall into line with the regulations you have discussed here? Um, they also noted that the, the Trump administration's goals seem a bit America first oriented. So how do we square that with the Outer Space Treaty? We will not finish this talk if we get on that talk. So here's here's gonna we're gonna set a rule now, the norm of behavior for this talk. So if you have a question that's pertinent to something I'm discussing, I'll take it in in the in the body of the talk. If you have something like that that's topical and current events oriented and somewhat theoretical and not directly on point to what I'm talking about, let's do it at the end so we have a chance to get through all of this because that's a that's going off on another. So the Space Force has to be compliant with everything that I'm telling you now. How that links up is nuanced, but we won't get through a discussion of resources if we go on to that because it's not the same discussion. Okay, I think, is that fair? Perfect, thank you. Sure. So COSPAR is the Committee for Space Research, and it is uh, it answers to the uh, to COPUS, and it deals with issues um, pertinent to planetary protection. Now, I'm not talking about planetary defense when when we think that asteroids are going to come and and and, and perhaps. Uh, have an adverse impact upon us here on Earth. I'm talking about planetary protection. And when we talk about planetary protection, we talk about two things, forward contamination, which means that we here on Earth, the things that we're doing off Earth are contaminating outer space or the moon or celestial bodies, okay? And there are different categories in, in, in uh, forward contamination that have to do with whether or not there are any life forms or, or there ever were any life forms or, or there, there are life forms now. <laughs> and so, you know, as we move through the categories, we have to be more and more careful because, not because we're trying to keep a pristine environment, but because we're trying to preserve science. So that's, that's, that's a, a distinction that must be mentioned. Now, backward contamination is when we're bringing things back. So if we're, if we're mining something and we're bringing it back to Earth, we have to be mindful that we could be bringing contamination back to Earth. And that would be category five of the guidelines. Now, the guidelines, are they're, they're not binding. They're not a treaty. Their guidelines. So they help direct us. And then different countries, different, different nations like the US can put things in place that are somewhat binding. So who's been going off planet up until now? It's been NASA here in the US. So NASA has some, some very stringent planetary protection rules that track with COSFAR and even go a little for, further. And so we'll, we'll talk about that as we go, that, that here we are. The NASA interim directives, which are brand new. So this is July, 2020. We are only now at the end of October. So a mere three and a half, uh, about three months uh, ago, we ended up with two directives. One deals with the moon, one deals with Mars. And it is not difficult to see why NASA 
thought it was necessary to go a little bit further than where Coast Guard's guidelines are right now, we are contemplating putting people onto the moon in, by 2024 in a, in a much more sustained presence. And we're gonna be doing things. We're not, it's not gonna be so symbolic. We're just collecting a few uh, geological samples, but it's gonna be a, a, a much more sustained presence. Hence, we are thinking about these things. And, and when we're talking about the Artemis mission, we're also looking at roles for the private sector, which is like the CLIPS program. So now we're, we're already starting to think about what we need to have in place in order to make sure that we remain compliant with Article 9 and that we don't do things that, that uh, create this, this adverse impact either on Earth or in, in space. And the, the, the most amazing thing about the NASA, in, the NID, we call them NIDs, the NID that deals with the moon is that instead of it being like one size fits all, that that category one to four applies to the entire moon, now it breaks it out because it is conceivable and we just had another wonderful uh, uh, discovery that was that was uh, in the news this week about now they're finding uh, evidence of water not just in the darker parts of the moon but but in the in the parts that are lighter and and, and, and more accessible so we're starting to see that there is, is um, necessity to getting more specific about how we uh, create the taxonomy so domestic loss, it doesn't all just happen at Copulus. It doesn't just all happen at the ITU. A lot of it happens in countries. And here in the US, a lot of it's happening in Washington, DC. So here are some examples. Um, I mean, we could have a class in each and every one of these, one or two classes. And so, yes, I, I, I echo Alyssa's um, little uh, advert in the beginning, please, I mean, come on down and take the class and we'll talk about a lot more of this uh, in spring semester. But um, the Communications Act of 1934, before there were even satellites in the sky, this this is the uh, where the authority for the FCC to right now be making orbital debris requirements comes from this law. And the Space Act of 1958, which formed NASA, but also allowed NASA to uh, negotiate and, and enter into agreements with other countries, hence the Artemis Accords, which we're going to talk about. The Commercial Space Launch Act of 1984, which is launch, and that's what allows the FAA um, to license uh, launches and re-entries. Um, the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act of 1992, which is what allows NOAA, which is uh, in, in the Department of Commerce where I work to license commercial remote sensing. Um, there were the Amendments Act in 2004, which um, expanded the 1984 legislation to allow for suborbital and also experimental permits. And all of that is just now going through an, a complete overhaul and streamlining process. Um, so in the beginning, in 1984, we were just talking about things that went up they didn't get used again and they were going up from federal facilities. Now it's a whole new world. We have SpaceX, which is reusing things. So they just overhauled a whole lot. But then in, in 2015, another omnibus legislation, a really important one, one that did one, one thing that's very dear to my heart, and that was that it, uh, it codified the policy goals of the office that I worked for, which had been ex in existence since 1988, but it was just working with policy goals that weren't in, in, enshrined in a statute. Um, but it also, in Title IV of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, Title IV allowed, it said that the U.S. recognized that the private sector can harvest, mine, transport, and sell resources, and that can do this and be and and that we 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 are mindful of our international obligations and in doing this we will do everything to stay uh, compliant and consistent with those international obligations, but that we we know that when we're allowing the private sector to do these things we are not allowing them you know the U S to to you know say this is now our property and 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 there are ways to manage it and we're going to look at how how we in the U S are in in visioning managing this as we get closer to Artemis. So that's what the crawl, walk, run, and dance is all about. Yeah. Uh, we have a quick question that I actually, I think you might be moving to answer it, but I, I'll put it out there. Our own Nick Baraka asks, how will private entities license mining resources in the space commons? Hashtag moon tuna. You're going to have to explain that to me, Nick. 
Will yeah. that be with national offices like the Department of Commerce, UN Office of Outer Space Affairs? What is the best way to avoid states or private entities claiming territory in space? Well, if it's if it's a, a party to the outer space treaty, there won't be any claims that that say this is you know um, you'll have a possibly a license to use, but not to own. So we already see that we have a, a very well developed uh, scheme in in spectrum and in orbits and and we, we the ITU does that the FCC does that and, and, and orbits are assigned not forever. I mean it's 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 you, you get to use it and if you don't use it you lose it. Um, it will be through national offices for sure whether it'll be the Department of Commerce or a combination of, of departments and agencies in the federal government I, I don't have a crystal ball. I know that we're thinking about how to, um, how best to make sure that um, we are authorizing and supervising um, in, in, a, in an effective way without um, hindering the ability to do things, but, but mindful of the obligations that we have through treaty and also the, um, the responsibilities we have as per the long-term sustainability guidelines, which the US has been extremely involved in, and we're not alone, other countries as well. So we're gonna talk about the Artemis Accords. We're certainly not alone with the Artemis Accords. Um, it, it, it's us plus a number of others, which we'll talk about. So, um, but that's how, it, that's how it's gonna work. It's, it, it, it will plug into the COPUA system, and, but, but it's the teeth come from national law. So in the crawling, Lunar Gateway is an outpost. It's, it's dealing with a lot of the human factors questions that are going to make Artemis um, successful. So that's like the crawling. Um, ESA just signed on to be a partner along with Japan and Canada. So we're starting to, to you know, see how that's taking shape. The Artemis program is, is going a little further. It's going from crawling to walking because um, Artemis, we're going to be doing things. And, and that's what the um, Artemis Accords are, are all about. The executive order on space resources from back last April, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's in there. The Artemis Accords are part of the walking, you know, as we get further and further. Um, NASA's request for quotes um, with regard to regolith is, is further walking. OSIRIS-REx even going and into deep space, you know, far, 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 far away and being able to bring things back. That's that's more walking. But what about Elon and Mars? That, that would be like running and dancing, but we're not there yet. So kind of um, similar to the question of the person who wanted to know how are we going to allow things like you know, mining on the moon? Well, even to get to Mars, you need a launch license. And if you're going to come back with these people, and I think that's the plan for some, uh, you need a reentry license. And we're not there yet. And and these are new activities. And so you have a lot of um, experienced people, smart people, um, visionary people, all together trying to hash it out in a way that um, utilizes everybody's uh, expertise and and and. We'll see how it parses out. So we're talking about resource exploration and use. And I told you we're going to talk a little bit about the tension between Article 1 and Article 2. One says, you know, the space freedoms, exploration and use for the benefit and the interest of everyone. And then Article 2 says, yeah, but no national appropriation. So how that tension because there is, a, there is a tension there. How that's getting managed is sort of evolving through a series of national and international initiatives, which I'm gonna list for you here. Um, the first is our legislation in 2015 that I touched upon that we recognize that these resources can be owned. And that's not the same as laying claim to territory. Right after 2015, starting in 2016, the international community responded with the Hague Space Resources Governance Working Group, which had people from governments, from NGOs, non-governmental organizations, from academia, and from industry, all together figuring out how to um, adequately manage all of the concerns from those that were worried about you know, whether or not these, these activities were going to um, you know, allow some countries to um, exclude others. And the, the concerns of those that had a lot of research and development going on, and they want to see their sectors continue, and they see benefits for all of us, just like we have with disaster management, with other things as well. So at, right, some, at the same time that all that was going on, there was a lot of discussion about how, you know what, 
we learned a lot of lessons from the International Space Station. We learned that countries, even countries that have some, some real ideological differences can get along and work well together in, in partnership, um, you know, floating in Leo <laughs> for, for many, many years. And so this understanding that, you know, these big expensive projects work better when we have cooperation and collaboration. And so, um, uh, you know, some of the people, for instance, Jan Werner, who's uh, still the director general of ESA, he brought it up at a, at a conference in, in a panel and he said, you know, we should make a moon village where we all get involved. Well, a moon village association sprung up and, and created its, uh, its charter. And so there's a lot of people figuring out how, what would the governance issues be? How would we handle that? further to the, the person who wanted to know would it be a national office, figuring out some of those things, but in the international context so that different countries that want to get involved kind of have an understanding of what the experts think the issues really are, similar to the Hague Space Resources. Um, then in, by 2019, NASA, which has a series of different uh, committees that advise it on different issues, it has a, a regulatory and policy committee that took the building blocks that that Hague Space Resources Group had come up with, and it, it made recommendations to NASA based on those, which helped inform those NIDs, those, those NASA interim directives. So this is how it all works together. So there, it's often the same people, or there's a few different people, but everybody's having these conversations, figuring out how we can and by listening, how we can address the concerns and, and yet continue to move it forward. There's also work that's going on at COPE US. So the legal subcommittee, um, it, it, things kind of got put on hold because of COVID. So they will likely get picked up again for the 21 uh, year. There's the possibility of a working group. Um, it, there's a possibility of an agenda item. It might stay informal for a while, but there's more and more discussion because we're, we're getting closer to these activities. The executive order on encouraging international support for the recovering and use of, outer, of, of space resources was uh, the current administration's uh, kind of underscore of a commitment to the Outer Space Treaty. It, uh, it kind of got lost in the very early days of lockdown. I think it was signed on April 6th, but it's important because it builds on that 2015 legislation and it clarifies its goals and intentions. Title IV in the 2015 legislation is tiny little. It's just a couple of sentences. So, you know, what do you do with that? But there's been all this work since in things like The Hague. And so this executive order really helps flesh it out. And it, and it says, the role of that, that copious has a role in developing best practices and that safety is fundamental and that it's not it maybe not to think of it just as like a, a, a global commons that we can't touch, but instead to think of it as a resource, a common pool resource that we can all benefit from. And, and it says, go forth and, and prosper and engage in statements and bilaterals. And guess what? We ended up with bilaterals. We have the Artemis Accords, which are getting a lot of press right now. So if you want to work with NASA for Gateway, you, you need other country, country B, C, D, or E, then you need to enter into the Artemis Accords. They are also grounded in the Outer Space Treaty, and they are based on the principles of peaceful purposes, transparency, interoperability, that we will release scientific data, protect heritage, extract and use resources, that this is acceptable, but we're gonna de-conflict our activities, another typo, I'm gonna fix that one too. And, uh, and this is in keeping with Article 9. And, and in some of this deconfliction, there, there are like ways to create zones, to, give, to, to register your activity and give notice that this is what you're doing and where you're doing it. Um, so there are seven countries that have joined the US in the Artemis Accords right now, Australia, Canada, Italy, Luxembourg, the UAE, and, and the UK. This is exciting. And this, is, this all was just in the last several weeks. So we're just getting started. Another really interesting thing that NASA did that, you, that really um, exhibits leaning forward is they put out um, a, a, probably about six weeks ago now, a request for quotations. This is open to private companies, international or US, and saying, you know what, NASA would like to purchase 50 to 500 grams of lunar regolith, which is like dust and rock. And we'll, we'll, you, you get it, we'll buy it. Um, to sort of like develop the practices that go along with this, so this is gonna help develop those norms to show 
how to, if you're going to work with NASA, it's got to be done responsibly. It's got to be done in concert with the with their NIDs, which are even stricter than the Coast Guard guidelines, and in keeping in concert with everything in the Outer Space Treaty. So I told you I was going to give you some supplemental materials and all of these links um, bring you to the, the source materials for the things that I just talked about. Um, but here are a lot of things for you to look up if you have an, an interest in, in finding these things. So there's a whole host of them. And these are some of the other relevant treaties. Um, some I talked about, some I did not. And then last but not least, you get my coordinates. And, and that's my cell phone if you, if you want to uh, text me or, or I, I'm more inclined to text than I am to pick up the phone. And, and certainly you can ping me. So I'm going to fix those two typos. Um, I, I, get a, I get an A minus because I had typos. And, um, and then I'll make sure that those get circulated to all of you. And now, um, if you want to reframe or, re or rephrase your question about Space Force, to me, I'm happy to answer that and any others. How am I doing with time? We are doing well. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And we have a question queued up from Matthew Orr to kick off a, a Q&A portion, if, if you sure. so please. Wonderful. Uh, Matthew Orr says, to what extent does your work involve using a comparative international law approach or examining what analogous offices in other countries are doing in space resources? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing today at 3.30. At 3.30, I am involved in a planning meeting with uh, my colleagues at the State Department and the FAA and my office um, to get ready for the next round of meetings with the Five Eyes. Um, so the Five Eyes, is, it was put together for intelligence purposes, but um, we made a Space Five group that, that is the same country. So it's the US, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And we share we share what we're doing. We share how we're um, addressing things that are surfacing um, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, from a technical standpoint, from a policy standpoint. So that's comparative law at its at its nitty grittiest. And um, that that's uh, we meet. Uh, we were meeting every two, you know twice every year. We we missed our, our June meeting for obvious reasons, and we were supposed to go to the UK uh, this November, but instead we're going to do it virtually. But this is an ongoing thing, and and um, from time to time we we reach out to one another within the group, just you know for some one-on-one -on -one help. Um, but that's not all. I mean, we, my office, enters into uh, MOUs with um, different countries. We have one with the, with Luxembourg. We have another with uh, the French Space Agency. We've been um, putting one together with the UAE um, to help us um, sort of set the tone of our discussions and, and, and our collaboration on our cooperation. And and a big piece of that is is. Um, is talking about how we're, my, my dog is getting, she, she's, she's restless, she's at the door. <laughs> so um, talking about how we're gonna address things from a regulatory standpoint, because the, the more information you get, the better your outcome is going to be. Does that answer? Absolutely, thank you. Sure. Um, so I have a question that more neatly relates to space traffic management, but I'm interested to see if there's perhaps a direct relationship between it and um, space resources, and that's about space insurance. So um, I've been learning more about space insurance recently and the opportunities that it pre uh, like presents from a space traffic management perspective to, you know, not only regulate behavior, but incentivize um, reporting and, and all sorts of wonderful potential benefits. In relation to space resources, does that, does the space insurance field have anything it can contribute other than, you know, making space traffic management uh, more readily accessible and workable? Well, you know, we didn't really talk a lot about the liability convention, but, but state parties, countries are on the hook for the for the, the screw ups of their nationals. Um, so, you know, insurance is a good way for a country to manage that risk for sure. And so likely there will be some liability piece with regard to um, private activities on, on the moon. How it's gonna look, well, we, we don't know. We, you know, there's, there, there has been some um, space insurance for some some activities like at the space station that that was put together and I know NASA put out a, a request for information several months ago um, and, and included the the uh, space 
insurance uh, people in this RFI to kind of figure out how best to manage that kind of risk when it was, you know, one, one extremely wealthy person going to the ISS and they only had to get, uh, you know, insurance for that activity and, and how it would impact other activities on the ISS. That's different than if you have a whole host of, of private sector private people that are, are working on multiple activities. So that's not finished, but you're right. Um, insurance is a wonderful way to incentivize the kind, to push the norms in the direction that you want. Um, and we see that it, with regard to space traffic management, there's not a lot of, of insurance for on orbit. There's, there are limits to it. It often doesn't go past a year. And, um, We'll see if that can change. I, I know that there is interest from some people, um, some people in the space insurance uh, part of things that um, they understand the, the, the power for good that they represent in, in shaping this. And um, I know that we, I told you we had put together this, uh, I think I, the two talks are kind of blending together, um, but we, we have a, a working group that's been helping the FCC and uh, with their rulemaking and, and, and insurance has come up a great deal in, 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 in that as well with regard to how to, um, whether or not there should be indemnification, how, how can that be handled? Excellent, thank you. Um, we have another question from a participant. Um, they say, hi, Dr. Howard, with the new NASA discovery of water on the moon, how will the NIDS be affected? And do you see any best practices in terms of sustainable water resources management slash utilization in the near future? Yeah, so I think that the NIDS were, um, they, they had a feeling, they had a, they had a, a, a real good feeling that, that this was a possibility. So the NID that deals with the moon is, is set up to be able to handle that. And the thing about the Coast Park guidelines and also these, these NASA interim directives is that they um, recognize the, that scientific discovery can happen at any time. And so they're flexible enough to adjust to, to um, accommodate those discoveries as they come up. So that that which is very good that that's built in um the practices are going to develop but i will tell you um you know the, this whole planetary protection forward and backward um contamination these issues are, are definitely um things that everybody's thinking about and um there's an understanding that we have a, a we have a, a, a hard law obligation as per article 9 to make sure that we do things responsible how that's going to pan out i don't know i mean responsible to one party and responsible to another party do not always mesh excellent thank you um, so I've been reading up a bit more on, on all of the conversations happening on space resources recently. As you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, there's a lot of news in that field and, and really exciting stuff happening. Um, I saw one spicy op-ed discussing the topic of taxes on space resources, and I would love to hear your thoughts on whether or not that there's an opportunity there, or if that's perhaps too um, bureaucratic. You know, it, and it might hinder some of the activities and, and would it ultimately at the end of the day really be um, effective to curtailing bad behavior. So you have to kind of take a look at what is it that you're trying to achieve? Are you, is it, you know, an aspirational goal? Um, so you're, you know, you're just trying to like collect money so that you can do things like have active debris removal someday or is it um, that you want to sort of penalize if you know if you you know if, if you do too much you get you, you're gonna so so there's different reasons there was another at the time that that came out I think that came out of Colorado when that that uh, use tax article came out there was another one by a, a friend and colleague of mine uh, Ruth Stillwell which you can also find and I think it's a very good rebuttal so you get both sides of that argument because there's you know pros and cons on both sides of that. So I, I, I would encourage you to look for her. And if you don't find her article, reach out, I have it. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Oh, and it looks like we've got something in the Q&A. Excellent timing, Stephanie. Um, Stephanie asks, what are the most strategic space resources that we should keep an eye on? She mentions helium-3, rare earth metals, etc. I don't think we know. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, it would be hubris for me to suggest that I, no, I don't think helium-3 and rare metals, yeah, yes, but who knows? I mean, there could be something that's, you know, the answer to our all of our propulsion woes. <laughs> um, 
who knows? We don't know. Maybe we'll find some some rarefied intelligence that that you know gives us forty three and the meaning of life, and you know, all of a sudden we'll we'll have all the answers. So I I don't know. Well, with that very exciting and aspirational ending, um, I think we can wrap up now. Dr. Howard, I would just like to thank you for your time again. It's been a wonderful and lively conversation. Um, we'll be sure to post your slides with um, the recording of this meeting on the Strauss Center website. And um, thank you again. We really appreciate it. After I fix them. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And, and this was a wonderful, um, a, a great discussion. Thank you, Alyssa. And thank all of you. Thank, thanks to all of you.